Okay? Splitting fields and more splitting fields for the most part. Then we are going to talk about some theorems on algebraic and finite extensions. In fact, in looking over what we've got here left for the semester, I'm realizing we really can't do a, a fully in-depth job on these chapters. So what I think I want to do is I want to highlight what I sort of think of as being the most important things that will get us to uh, getting into Galois theory a little bit the last couple days of class. It's going to be kind of like that chapter 11, I think it was, on the uh, fundamental theorem of finite degree of groups, where we just get a little taste of it, um, talk about a few basic problems. So I think if we can get there, we can maybe sort of ignore some things that we've been reading about, especially perhaps in chapter 20. Not that it's unimportant, but it's just too much to handle within the time that we have. Did want to give you a little, some little stories here still about me from the past. Uh, some, a couple sports related stories and maybe a couple more. Better make these quick so that I have time to do the math that we have. Uh, so I think I talked about how, uh, how I was bad at basketball and how I was bad at soccer, right? I talked about those things. So I was also bad at baseball and bad at football, but I tried. Okay, what's my baseball story? Well, okay, when I was in third grade, uh, we did underhand pitch, and I did okay at that, as you might imagine. But once I get to fourth grade, then we did fast pitch, and then I didn't do so well. Uh, the fourth grade baseball, I didn't get a hit this, the entire season. Okay, and I played pretty much every game as far as I remember. So I would either strike out or walk. Okay, but when I walked, I would steal a base sometimes, and I would score some runs. But so it wasn't all bad that way. I did start to get some hits in later years. I kept at it. Um, I think maybe I got two or three hits the next year, and I think the next year after that I might have gotten ten hits or something like that. So I did get a little bit better. But uh, those, those were not highlights as much as two other things I want to bring out. The, the two main highlights of my baseball career, and they're kind of funny. So uh, one, one highlight was that I was up second or third season, uh, and when I did get a hit it was usually just a single, you know, just a grounder through the middle or something like that. Um, but I, I, I was up to bat and I hit the ball. I hit it really, really far. In fact, I followed it kind of like that. But it was a foul ball. That wasn't the best part of it, though. I, I did hit it really far, which was satisfying, even though it was foul. The best part was when I came up the next at bat, I actually heard somebody say, play back. OK. So that was, that was a highlight of my career. A second highlight was that I came up once with the bases loaded, and the pitcher was this huge kid. I was kind of a, a small kid. Not only was I small, I was also slow. And not only was I small and slow, I was also uncoordinated. So I, I couldn't hit very well either. But anyway, I came up with the bases loaded, and this really huge kid uh, was the pitcher. I come up with the bases loaded. He laughs at me. But I showed him, I proceeded to walk on four straight pitches, and I, I got an RBI out of it. So that was the second main highlight of my career. Thank you. OK. Anyway, back to math now. Um, before we get into splitting fields, I thought it would be good to go over one of the uh, completion problems. Uh, this one. Why is, for example, this true? Now, what does this notation mean again? Think of these as being subfields of, say, the real numbers. Okay, That's the, the background field extension, if you will, that contains these roots, square root of 2 and square root of 3. Remember that this notation means this is the smallest subfield of the real numbers. It's a field extension of the rationals that contains those roots, root 2 and root 3. And this, on the other hand, is the smallest subfield of the reals, also a field extension of the rationals. That contains the sum root two plus root three, and the claim these things is these, these things are equal. Okay. This does take some careful thought. This is one of the kinds of problems that gave me a lot of trouble when I was your age. In addition to just thinking about splitting fields, as well as some experimentation. Sometimes, sometimes you just got to be willing to get some scratch paper out and do some experimentation to try to figure these things out. I'm going to go through an explanation of this. You should listen carefully, take some notes. You should be able to give the argument carefully and thoroughly that I'm going to go through. I'm probably not going to write it all out. Some of it I'll just say verbally for the sake of time, because we have a lot of examples to do today. 
but you should listen carefully, write as much as you can, and maybe watch this part of the video again to make sure you get it. Through the argument, it is important to use the facts that fields are closed under addition and therefore also subtraction, which is really, again, adding additive inverses, and under multiplication, and of course that means division by non-zero elements because that's really multiplying by multiplicative inverses and, and fields are commutative, so you don't have to worry about is there any problem with writing fractions. You can write fractions. As well as the fact that, again, as I mentioned, the notation refers to the smallest subfield of a given extension containing the zeros that also contains the zeros, and that's not a typo, by the way. I meant to say that in the way that I did. It's a little confusing. These are subfields of the reals, thinking of the reals as an extension of the rationals. And the, again, this, for example, is the smallest subfield of the reals. The reals do contain those zeros, and this field contains the zeros. So it's the smallest subfield of the reals as an extension of the rationals that contains those roots, just like the reals contain the roots, but that's smaller than the reals. This doesn't include things like square root of 5, for example. And then we'll try to figure out what is the basis of this as a vector space over the rationals and what is its dimension. But let's think about uh, why this was true, first of all. Okay, first of all, why is, say, the second one a subset of the first? You could also call it a subfield. These are fields by definition. Okay. You don't have to prove these are fields. These are fields by definition of what this notation means. So all you have to do to show their subfields is show their subsets. That's the easier direction. Why is it easier and how would you do it? Um, well, certainly this field contains square root of 2 to square root of 3. Certainly square root of 2 and square root of 3 are in that field because as an extension of the rationals, this is the smallest subfield of the reals containing these two roots, root 2 and root 3. So by definition, these are in there, maybe even by definition is better instead of just saying certainly. By definition. This is a field. It's closed under addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division by non-zero elements. So if I, for example, add these two things, that's going to be in that field by closing. Closure. I claim that basically does it. But wait a minute, I haven't started with something in here and shown it in something in there. You don't need to. This, by definition, is, as a field extension of the rationals, the smallest subfield of, say, the reals, containing root 2 plus root 3. But root 2 plus root 3 is in here. This has got to be bigger than that, so to speak. This is smaller than that. That's going to make this tricky. You, you, the argument is not to start with something in here, give me an arbitrary element in here, and show it's in there. That theoretically, you might be able to do that. But it's easier, in a sense, though tricky, to do it in the way that I just said. I know these two elements are definitely in there, and this is a field. By closure under addition, the sum is in there. But by definition of this symbol, this is an extension of the rationals. Think of it as a subfield of the reals, for example, or the complexes. Whatever you want, something bigger. It's the smallest subfield of the reals containing root 2 plus root 3. So since this contains root 2 plus root 3, it must be bigger. This must be a subset of that. Okay, I said that verbally, I won't write it down. The other direction is a bit trickier. 
However, the overall strategy could be thought of as being the same. I'm not going to start with an arbitrary element in there and show it's in there. Instead, I'm going to show root 2 and root 3 individually are in here. Catch that? I'm going to show root 2 and root 3 individually are in here, and therefore this is true because this is the smallest subfield of the reals containing root 2 and root 3. Therefore, if this contains it, then both, this would have to be bigger than that. This would have to be a subset of that. Odd kind of argument, that's the best way to go. Why is it trickier? Because you have to do some experimentation to try to figure out, because of closure, why root 2 and root 3 are in here. That's why it's trickier. Maybe you saw it in my key. What I ended up experimenting with is considering, you know, for example, what does this equal? What's the multiplicative um, inverse of root 2 plus root 3, which is definitely in here? This has got to be in there as well, because it's a field, but what does it equal? Well, do a little bit of trickery with sort of multiplying by what you might call a conjugate on the top and the bottom. Hope things work out nicely. Let's see what happens. This doesn't always work out nicely, but go ahead and foil out the bottom. The outside and inside term can terms cancel. You're going to be left with root 2 times root 2 is 2. And a minus root 3 times root 3 is minus 3, negative 1. This simplifies to root 3 minus root 2. That's got to be in here. And it is. I knew it had to be ahead of time. How is this helpful? A little bit more trickery, just a little bit more experimentation. For example, root 2 plus root 3 plus this thing, negative root 2 plus root 3, simplifies to 2 root 3. The root 2 is canceled. So 1 half times this equals root 3. What have I just shown? I've just shown by closure and by the fact that I know this is in here, I guess I didn't have to do it as a reciprocal, but I did anyway. Technically speaking, it, it, without a theorem, it's probably best to think about it in the way that I did. Without a theorem telling us how to write arbitrary elements of this field, it is probably best to do it the way that I did. Um, I just verified by closure that root 3 is in here because I've got two things in there that are added by closure under addition. It's going to still be in there. Multiplying by one half by closure under multiplication, and one half definitely is in here, is going to tell me that root 3 is also in here. Is root 2 in there? Sure. Um, do this instead. Take root 3 plus root 3, uh, root 2 plus root 3 minus negative root 2 plus root 3 and multiply by a half up in front and that's going to simplify down to root 2. So once again without a theorem telling us what arbitrary elements in this look like it is probably best to use this approach. I know root 2 plus root 3 is in there and therefore its reciprocal is in there which happens to equal root 3 minus root 2 and then by closure under addition and multiplication, I can do a little bit more trickery. I can add these things, then multiply by a half, or subtract them, then multiply by a half, to show that root 2 and root 3 are in this field individually, which is enough to say this is a subset of that because this is the smallest subfield of the reals, for example, containing root 2 and root 3 as a field extension of the rationals. So it's got to be a subset of that. This has got to be bigger. And you, I only said those kinds of things verbally. You should be able to write that down. Because this is, by definition, the smallest subfield of, for example, the reals containing these things. It must be a subset of the other. I always found those arguments to be tricky, OK? So if you feel like it was tricky, you're, you're not alone. What's the
the basis? What's the basis of this field? Is vector space over the rationals? What is its dimension? Um, without proof, let me just tell you what the answer is here. Um, it's going to turn out by a theorem. Well, first of all, you can think of this in this way, which is a little confusing. What am I doing there? These are both field extensions of the rationals. Think of them as subfields of, of, say, the real numbers. This, by definition, is the smallest subfield of the reals, containing both root 2 and root 3. And it equals this, I claim. This is really a field extension of the rationals adjoined to root 2. It would be the smallest subfield of the reals that's an extension of this that contains root 3. We already know this contains root 2. It's not really proof, but that's a verbal brief explanation. It's going to turn out by a theorem that I haven't had the time to show you yet in class that you, you can write the elements of this in the following form. I'll show you what theorem I'm using here in a minute. Essentially, things in here are linear combinations of 1 and root 3, where the coefficients, the scalars, are in here. And things in there are of this form. And if you multiply this all out and simplify a bit, you can write this as a plus c plus b root 2 plus c root 3 plus d root 6, two, root 2 times root 3 there, where a, b, c, and d are rational. And essentially what we've got here then is a linear combination of four vectors, quote unquote, 1, root 2, root 3, and root 6, which we technically, you need to be able to prove those are linearly independent. This as a vector space over the rationals would be four-dimensional. You've got a basis with four elements. So this is relating back to the linear algebra. There's a basis and the dimension would equal four. So you've got four elements and the basis. Okay, I haven't proved things here. We're just sort of taking this on faith right now. Uh, this is related to a theorem that I didn't, I wanted to talk about in the last lecture, but I didn't have time for it. I forgot to put it in today's lecture slides. So I'm back, going back to lecture 33 here. Um, it's the second theorem that you see here. Let F be a field, and let P of X be a polynomial in F of X that is irreducible over F. So imagine f initially, say, here is q. If a is 0, p of x in some extension of f. Then this symbol there, that, that's the uh, a field extension of f that is the smallest subfield of e containing the root a. And a has got to be an e, but not f, because p of x is irreducible. This is going to be isomorphic to this factor ring. Ignore that for the moment. More importantly, focus on the very bottom here. E, every member of this field extension can be written as a linear combination, is essentially what this says, in a unique way. Where these A's that are powers of the zero are, they form the basis, and the C's are the coefficients. So coming back over here, When I thought about this line, essentially the A was root 3. This, in, in this line here, this field was F, and root 3 was A. So the C's are these two things in this theorem. A is root 3, and in fact, A to the 0, you might say, was 1. That corresponds to the constant term here. And this is telling you the basis has got dimension and the vector space has dimension n. As a vector space over this, this is two-dimensional because you've got two elements in the spaces. But 
as a vector space over Q because you can expand it out to write these things as uh, linear combinations of these four elements. This whole thing is four dimensional over Q. I know that gets confusing. You can also think about this with a diagram. That looks like this. this is a common thing to do. As a vector space over this, this is two dimensional. This being a vector space over this is also two dimensional. All together, the original one is a vector space over Q is four dimensional. I know that went fast. It's not something you can really digest in a couple minutes. I want to get on to some other things though. Um, I would encourage you to think about this more, maybe rewatch this part of the video too, as you do the reading. It's sort of a highlight of an application of this theorem. I want to get on, get on to some other examples of splitting fields though. That's the main thing we're doing today. These examples are going to go by pretty fast as well. It's not something that's easy to digest in a short amount of time. Maybe you should rewatch the entire video today. It's a lot of content that's difficult to digest in a short amount of time. Let's get into it. We'll do the best we can with the time that we have. What is the splitting field, for example, of x cubed plus 1 over the rations? It's helpful as I talked about on Monday, to think about complex numbers here. Know some things about complex arithmetic. Solutions of, or zeros of the polynomial x cubed plus 1 are, if you think about it, cube roots of negative 1. Looking for where x cubed plus 1 is 0 is equivalent to looking for where x cubed is equal to negative 1. And if you know some things about complex numbers, and I'm teaching you those things here now, if you don't know about them, you know you've got three roots in the complex point plane, one of which is going to be the real number, negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. That is a cube root of negative 1. But there are two others that are not real. And I, I said this on Monday. I'll say it again. When you multiply complex numbers, Visualize them in this complex plane where this axis is called the real axis and that one's the imaginary axis. Those are just labels. This is just a way to visualize complex numbers. You multiply their distances to the origin and you add their angles. It's a beautiful fact about complex number arithmetic that really every math major should know. Even though we don't have an official complex analysis course here at Bethel, I'm taught complex analysis as part of topics in math as you may have heard of last year. So what does that mean in this context? Well, since negative 1 is one unit from the origin, if I'm going to find cube roots of it, those have to be one unit from the origin as well. Because when I multiply complex numbers, the distances to the origin multiply. Since the angles add, and since the angle for this one, think about polar coordinates here, is 180 degrees, pi radians, one cube root, at least, has got to be 60 degrees, pi over 3 radians. Right there. That angle is 60 degrees. And we can figure out using trigonometry, essentially polar coordinates, what point that is. It's going to be cosine of 60 degrees plus I sine of 60 degrees. And that's going to be 1 half plus I times square root of 3 over 2. And you can confirm, I won't take the time to do it. You can confirm if you cube this, you do get negative 1. And geometrically, it makes sense too, because this is one unit from the origin, so if I multiply it by itself twice, if I cube it, um, I'm going to continue getting numbers that are one unit from the origin. And the angle gets added. 60 plus 60 is 120, plus another 60 is 180. It's complex conjugate down here. 
which you could think of as cosine of 60 degrees minus I sine 60 degrees, or if you prefer, you can think of it as cosine of negative 60 degrees plus I sine negative 60 degrees. Or you could also use 300 degrees. It is 1 half minus square root of 3 over 2i. You can check that's a cube root of negative 1 as well. Think of the angles negative, say, negative 60 plus negative 60 is negative 120, plus another negative 60 is negative 180, giving you another angle for its cube. If you thought of it as an angle of 300, 300 plus 300 plus 300 is 900. 900 degrees goes around the circle, what, twice, and then another half. Did I do it too many times? One, two, and a half. Right, 900 degree term. Put you at the same spot as well. But again, algebraically, you should, you should verify for yourself, if you don't believe it, that if you cube this thing, you get negative one. So what is the splitting field of this polynomial over Q? Well, symbolically, you could certainly write it like this. Q1, comma, 1 half plus square root of 3 over 2i, comma, 1 half minus square root of 3 over 2i. But 1 is already a rational number, so maybe I don't need to include that. And the answer is yes, you, don't, you do not need to include 1 in this notation. It's not really being a join because it's already in Q. And you might also hope that since these are complex conjugates, maybe you can get away with just including one of them. And that is the case. You can just include one of them. Okay. Um, quick verbal verification of that. If you could verify that this thing right here. Um, definitely you have this being a subset of the other one. So the only tricky thing would be to verify the other inclusion. If you could verify 1 half minus root 3 over 2i is in here, that would verify this because this by definition is the smallest subfield of the complex numbers in this case as a field extension of the rationals that contains this thing. So if you show that thing is in here, you'd be done. <coughs> That's fairly easy to do, actually. If you know about complex number, geometric meaning of arithmetic here. If you take this number and raise it to the, what would it be? It would be the fifth power. Remember, the distance to the origin is going to stay one. As I keep multiplying it by itself, the angle keeps adding 60, then 120, then 180 when I cube it, then 240 when I raise it to the fourth power. Angle's going to be 300 degrees when I raise it to the fifth power. You should check if you raise this to the fifth power. You get this. 1 half plus root 3 over 2i to the fifth power, I claim, as 1 half minus root 3 over 2i. And that would be enough to verify by closure that this thing is in here, and therefore this is a subset of that. Okay? So, in its simplest form, you could write the splitting field like this. That's the answer in its simplest form. Got that? That's the answer in its simplest form. You could, that's the answer too, but this is a simpler form. The simpler form is definitely better because it can help you think about other kinds of questions like what is the dimension of this field as a vector space over the rationals, which would allow you then by that theorem I showed you five, ten minutes ago to write elements of this field as linear combinations. You'd have to be careful though. You might be tempted to say the answer is 3 because you've got a cube there. However, that would be wrong in this example because this polynomial is not irreducible over Q. It's actually irreducible. <laughs> it's the sum of two cubes.
that are both, well, the coefficients of which are rational. x cubed plus 1 is the sum of two cubes. You can write it as x plus 1 times x squared minus x plus 1. Using there is the fact that I showed you the difference of two cubes last time. Here's the sum of two cubes. Whoops, got the next thing. In fact, they're like that. And it's tempting to put a two there. Don't put a two there. You're not squaring the binomial. You're factoring the sum of two cubes. This thing right here is irreducible over Q. Its roots are, in fact, these two complex numbers that are complex conjugates of each other. You could double check that by expanding out x minus 1 half plus root 3 over 2 i times x minus 1 half minus root 3 over 2 i. You could double check, I'm claiming, If you multiply that out, you get this. This is irreducible over Q. The original is not. These two complex roots are zeros of this thing. And essentially, by that theorem I showed you, now, say, 10 minutes ago, that's going to mean as a dimension, as a vector space over Q, it's going to be two dimensional. And the basis is going to consist of the number one and this number, say one half plus root three over two i. It'll be two dimensional, not three dimensional. Almost quiz time. Let's get a start on this example. How we want to finish it before quiz. Uh, splitting fields for x to the fourth plus one over q and over r, and the answers are different. When you talk about splitting fields, you are talking about field extensions in general of a given field, but it's always with respect to that given subfield. And so the answer depends not just on what the roots are but what the given base field, you might say, is over Q and over R. Complex zeros of this are going to be in the complex plane, those four points. All purely complex numbers, or I should say non-real numbers. And the geometry of complex number arithmetic is, again, what can help you figure this out. These uh, zeros of x to the fourth plus one are going to be roots of negative one. Think about negative one, it's distance to the origin is one, so these all have to be one unit from the origin, and its angle is 180 degrees. When you multiply complex numbers, the angles add. One root certainly has to have an angle of 180 degrees divided by four, 45 degrees. Which is what that one does. That would be, think about your trigonometry, one over root two plus one over root two i. Cosine of 45 degrees plus i sine 45 degrees. It's going to turn out that three other roots are going to be equal angles apart from each other, and all 90 degree angles apart from each other around this unit circle in the complex plane. Let's pause this example right now so we can take the quiz, then we'll come back to it.